I am very privileged to speak here, and at the same time, I feel very strange feeling uh, just coming from the other philosophical tradition, but I think that it may be also interesting how I see it from uh, some other principles. Not infrequently have I encountered the objection that personal is why elevating human beings diminishes animals. I believe this objection to be only partially justified. In my presentation, I will attempt to demonstrate that personal is conceived of as an outstanding and special instance of value ethics, postulates its own completion in the form of an insight into animal ethics. The reason is that the field of the moral ought is determined by two values, the person and life. Thus the radical hiatus between the value of a human being and the value of, of an animal being presupposed in the ideas of the leading philosophers of modernity cannot be rationally defended. The human is developed by modern philosophy, sometimes described as the anthropological breakthrough, has created an invigorating climate for the growth of the culture of human rights. Yet this project focus, focused on the emancipation of the human being and so eagerly advanced by the philosophers of the modern era is accompanied uh, by an aggravation of the fate of animals uh, degraded to the status of products, objects of consumption, and as a result of intensive breeding subjected to suffering unknown in white life. In my view, why Descartes and Kant are not to be directly blamed for the growing cruelty of humans towards animals, the humanist bias of those philosophers contributed unquestionably to the prevalence of the attitude of speciesism. The Cartesian concept of animals as automata meant that animals were in theory denied subjectivity, which in practice opened the way for human thinking beings to dominate them completely. Likewise, in the Kantian ethics of the categorical imperative, the key argument for ethical deontologies rested on the understanding of the human person as an end in itself. Kant would not allow spreading the limits of the ontology so that it would encompass other living beings since he did not see how it might be possible to recognize ends in themselves in beings other than persons. In, in the ethics, the, the human persons, obviously. In the ethics of moral autonomy, the intrinsic human dignity is derived from the fact that subjects endowed with freedom are capable of making the moral law. Since animals do not formulate categorical imperatives, they cannot be subjects to them. The Kantian exclusion of animals from the bounds of moral duty is a con consequence of the assumption that respect, kindness, and care are due only to beings capable of rationally commanding such attitudes to themselves as norms and of binding themselves with this norms through universal law, which implies reciprocity. Modern humanism, including its crystallization in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, which is open to a personalist interpretation, draws on the actual experience of the special position the human being enjoys in the world. Transcendence, observes Karol Wojtyła, a personalist thinker whose ideas were deeply rooted in the modern philosophy of the subject, is another name for the person. Still, we must stress the anthropocentric bias of modern personalists has obscured the fact that human persons are not the only living beings in this world. It is at this point that the intellectual heritage of modernity needs a rethinking or amendment, which will make it possible for us to retain the essentially personalist sense of modern humanism and simultaneously purify it by removing the mark of the isola isolationism of the human species has left on it, leading to various forms of uh, species. Uh, what we know about animal lives today radically departs from what Descartes and Kant had to say about them. Animals can no longer be denied the status of subjects. 
Animal psychology has described the emotional and cognitive processes characteristics of them. We know that animals demonstrate cognitive and communicational skills and abilities. While the results of ethological research are sometimes ambivalent, showing both similarities and differences between non-human and human behaviors. It is a fact that manifestation of sympathy, friendship, care, and justice, phenomena to which we usually attribute moral value, may be empirically observed among animals. The rigid and narrow categories of subjectivity and morality, the pillars on which the modern, the modern humanist philosophies have built the edifice of personalist moral exclusivism, begin to crack when confronted with the rich knowledge a whole range of sciences provides on animal subjectivity and morality. Does this mean that we need to abandon the entire concept of the difference between human and animal existence? I believe it would be too radical a move and one encumbered with another monistic tendency in the interpretation of being. At this point, we need to ask two fundamental questions. Does any instance of subjectivity mean that we are dealing with a person? Is it really the case that the only possible response to the threat of species is to consider all living beings as belonging to one species? I do not think we can answer yes to either of these questions. The difference between a person and non-personal being, despite its being a difference of kind rather than of degree, does not provide a ground for restricting the range of the moral duty merely to persons. In order to make personalists open and to the recognition of moral duties towards animals, we must depart from the Kantian justification of moral law based on the analysis of the law-giving will of the subject of morality. Instead, we need to analyze the axiological structure of the reality the human subject encounters while acting. Also, the cognitive and moral phenomena in animals are absolutely fascinating. Animals are incapable of transcending the centricity of their existence. It would demand to, to be explained perhaps much more. They are self-conscious beings, but an animal is unable to identify itself with a self-conceived of as ego. Uh, animals can experience emotions, and in some cases they are capable of rational thinking, more than that, owing to their communication skills, they even can uh, they can even play or participate in a game. Still, they are incapable of producing a language that would comprise a grammar. Animals are intentionally driven towards the objects of their desires, but incapable of experience, experience experiencing second-order desires, which, as Harry Frank Frankfurt observes, make a person capable of relating to his or her volitions. While discovering a close relatedness between humans and animals, we cannot disregard the fact that only human beings can reflect on such phenomena and explore the ontological and axiological meaning of their capacity to reflect on these issues. Uh, interestingly, while morality as such is a phenomenon restricted to humans, it encompasses also non-human beings. Therefore, we need to keep the distinction between the subject of morality or the agent, who is always a person, and the object or the adequacy of moral duty, which can be either a personal or non-personal being. It is only understandable that among all non-personal non beings, animals occupy a prominent position. This does in the tradition of St. Francis of Assisi, they are called our lesser brethren. The reason why we have moral duties towards animals is not exclusively our close relatedness to them or even a possible brotherhood between humans and animals. 
we need to seek an objective source of moral duty rather than derive obligation merely from our sympathy towards beings that are closely related to us. For that matter, Kant is right in saying that the grounds on which a human person must be treated as an end in itself and never merely as means is not the specific emotional bond with similar beings, but the fact that persons belong to the kingdom of ends. Beings are admitted to this kingdom insofar as they, according to Kant, exhibit moral autonomy, which consists in their being sovereign lawgivers who find themselves bound by the categorical imperatives. Kant's moral insight is cogent when he stress, stresses that moral duty in its nature is unselfish. Yet, his claim that the dignity of the person derives from the person's moral autonomy, while moral autonomy presupposes human dignity, seems problematic. Unless we are dealing with a circular argument, there must be a gap in his understanding of the sources of moral duty. The experience of moral duty becomes more understandable once we recognize that moral duty is actually funded on the truth about the value of the object or addressee of our actions and attitudes. Value ethics, which explains that morality is human response the response of the human being conceived uh, of as a person to the recognition of what the truth about values is fills the gap which Kant seems to have disregarded in his otherwise revolutionary ethics which opened new prospects for moral philosophy indeed. Kant's categorical imperative may be enriched by its interpretation in the terms of the value ethics. The fundamental moral norm proposed uh, by Karol Wojtyła commands respect for the person as person and as such corresponds to the commandment of love for the neighbor. Uh, uh, ethical cognitivism leads Wojtyła further to the formulation of the principle that is even more general than the personalist norm itself. He writes about the normative normative power of truth. In the context of this principle, whatever we know about the human being and the world is morally significant. Once recognized, the truth about the good is binding for the subject and obliges the subject to live according to this truth. As Pope John Paul II, Wojtyla published an encyclical letter on the foundations of morality and gave it a distinctive title, Veritatis Splendor, the splendor of the truth. In it, he speaks about the splendor of truth since truth has both theoretical and moral impact. However, it does not mean that recognition of truth as such makes a human being morally good. Rather, the point is that human beings can grow morally owing to their attitude to the knowledge they have grasped. It means that morality is accomplished within human conscience in which the cognitive content about the state of affairs once grasped by the subject becomes the ultimate source of freely accepted and from now on binding moral imperative. Truth generates duty. Five. Uh, thus moral duty can be stated uh, not only in relation to human beings. An epistemologically grounded conception of personalized ethics is capable of incorporating the present day knowledge of the value of, of the lives of animals uh, and of their subjectivity without, however, diminishing the status of humans who remain the only moral agents in the realm of being and thus the exclusive subjects of morality, which implies that they should embrace animals with even deeper care and take responsibility for their lesser brethren. Reflection on the responsibility of humans for the fate of animals is becoming an increasingly pressing issue since the development of modern civilization was a one-way process favoring the existence of human beings exclusively. The victims of the tendency have been animals. Had it not been for the lesson taught by modern humanists, the ideal of care for the welfare of animals might not have emerged in the history of morals. 
Thus, the criticism of modernity must not be targeted at the humanists it promotes. Rather, it needs to focus primarily on um, this interpretation of the humanist ideas, which not infrequently takes the arrogant form of specialist exclusivism. Such a revision of humanism in a poetic uh, condensation can be found in the poems of Gary Snyder, an outstanding representative of the Beat Generation. I quote from the Turtle Island, is man most precious of all things then let us love him and his brothers, all those fading living beings. North America, Turtle Island, taken by invaders who wage war around the world. May ants, may abalon, otters, wolves, and elk rise, and pull away their giving from the robot nations. Solidarity, the people, standing tree people, flying bird people, swimming sea people, four-legged, two-legged people. Referring to animals as men's brothers, the contemporary poet resembles Saint Francis, yet the dramatic tone of Snyder's poetry differs from the ge gentleness of the Assisi poet's verse. Saint Francis did not have the experience of the world in which numerous animal species have become extinct, and breeding of useful animals has been industrialized, bringing suffering to billions of living creatures treated as products while others have been subjected to cruel experiments devised to forward the progress of civilization. Snyder's rebellious appeal must resound and be heard because the ideal of St. Francis has been lost and the modern world has turned into its negation. Snyder speaks about living beings, plants for legged and two-legged animals in terms of humanity. What he means is both, in both cases, is kinship, not identity. The poet seems to be saying that the question of human dignity is man most precious of all things, calls in the first place for the recognition of the dignity of the realm of life of which man partakes, his contribution being his ability to ask questions as well as his solidarity with all creatures, creatures and rebellion against injustice. Thank you.